bring to the platform right now Mark Gaffney on being an outrageous lover. He's going to break it down for you right now. Good morning. good morning. Give me a good morning. Good morning. Yo. Yo is like the opposite of oi. I'm Jewish. We made it through the exile on oi, but yo is like a big thing. We're, we're developing actually a, a lot of kind of new Jewish methodologies that are kind of, you know, easier than the old stuff. So, for example, I was actually just thinking about my friend Sally Kempton, who's a yoga teacher. We've actually got a new advanced method of yoga. How many people here do yoga? But it's kind of hard, right? Like downward facing dog. It's like, you know, it hurts. So I can give you like a Jewish yoga thing. You ready? <laughs> left hand out. Left hand out. Get the thumb up. Ready, ready? Yo. Try it again. Ready? Yo. One more time. Yo. Right hand. Right hand. Here we go. Right hand. Right hand. Yo. That's the whole thing. You're done. Isn't that easier? Okay. So it's so good to be here, right? So good to be here. And I was here actually nine years ago. And and Reverend Michael and I have been kind of in, in deep synchrony and touch when we're talking and when we're not. And, you know, when we started to do this Success 3.0 Summit, which was I convened with John Mackey, the chair of Whole Foods, and my brother and Ken Wilbur. And I said, Who, who's the one person, like in the entire world, that we need to convene this with? It was clear as day. It was Reverend Michael. I didn't tell him that I was inviting him. I kind of sent an invitation without saying it was me. He said, that must be Mark. And he kind of showed up and big time. Right, and kind of just lifted and we just kind of flew together and we're starting actually a whole together 3.0 world, kind of the new TED Talks, right? Kind of the next step. TED is awesome. They just don't do spirituality. They do all the real stuff. Actually, the real stuff is where spirit moves. So we're starting a new vision of 3.0 TED Talks with Reverend Michael and, and Tony Robbins and John Mackey. And it's kind of happening in the world. Yes. Like a big yes. And... You know, whenever, you know, I, I've been here once before, I kind of slid in in the cheap seats just to kind of hear the chanting. And I happen to love to chant. Um, in my family, you know, there's lots of great voices. I, I can't quite carry a tune, but um, I chant anyways. So I just remembered actually in the little break, the chant that we did nine years ago kind of came into my mind. So I just want to start there. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, so it kind of goes like this. Ready? Dum ba dum ba dum ba dum ba dum ba dum ba boom, boom, boom. Dum ba dum ba dum ba dum ba dum ba dum. Give me little drums. Dum ba dum ba dum ba bum. Little a clapping and some drums. Dim ba dum ba dim ba. I can't hear you, bunch of losers. Dum ba dum da dum da da. Ba dim ba dim ba boom boom boom. Dim ba dum ba dum da dum ba dim ba dum ba dim ba da. Dim ba dum ba dum da dum ba dim da dum da dum da da. Nimba randa rinda hey hey Are we ready? Say love the earth Oh love the sky Oh love the sky Say I can hear you I can hear you Love the earth Oh love the earth Oh love the sky Oh love the sky Say heat of fire Heat Drop of water Drop of water I can feel it I can feel it In my body In my body In my spirit And in my soul Three, four Say love the earth Love the earth Oh love the sky Oh love the sky Say heat of fire Heat of fire Drop of water Drop of water I can feel it, I can feel it in my body, in my body, in my spirit, and in my... Hey, I can hear you, love the earth, oh, love the earth, oh, love the sky, oh, love the... Say, heat of fire, heat of fire, drop of water, drop of water. I can feel it, I can feel it in my body, in my body, in my spirit, and in... Left hand up, left hand up, left hand up. Hey ya, 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 ho. Hey ya, 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 ho. Hey ya, 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 hey. Hey ya, hey ya, hey ya, hey ya, ho, ho, ho. Say hey ya, 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 ho. Hey ya, 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 ho. Hey ya, 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 ho. Hey ya, hey ya, hey ya, hey. Good morning! Say love the earth, oh love the earth, oh love the sky, oh love the... Say heat of fire, heat of fire, drop of water, drop... 
Hey, I can feel it, I can feel it in my body, in my body, in my spirit, and in my soul. Hey, hey, say, hey, ya, 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 hey, hey, ya, 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 Hey ya, hey ya, hey ya, hey ya, ho, last time, say love the earth, the love, oh, love the sky, say heat of fire, a drop of water, oh, we can feel it, we can feel it in our body, in our body, in our spirit, and in our soul, last time, say hey ya, 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 ho, hey ya, 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 ho, hey ya, hey ya, drum roll. Hey ya! Oh, oh. Bring it up! Bring it up! Woo! Amen. Amen. L'chaim. L'chaim is the point of this talk, so we'll get back to that. Just to tell you a quick story. Just awesome to be here. Yeah, so good. So good. So. About 15 years ago, I was in a, um, uh, I was in a hotel room, and you know, it was a, a kind of a book tour for a book I had just done there called Soul Prince, kind of back in the day. And you know, you're on, a, you're on a tour, and you kind of get back to your room at the end of the day, and you're kind of lonely, and you're not sure kind of what to do, because you've kind of been, kind of done everything, kind of a lot of energy and a lot of beauty. You get to your, your hotel room, and it kind of a kind of wave of emptiness kind of rolls over you. And what's there to do? Cable, cable's not that exciting. I didn't have any books with me. I usually carry a, a bag of Aramaic third century texts, which is, works for me kind of in a Prozac kind of way. You know, and my, my Aramaic texts had gone to Kansas City. I was in Denver. I don't know what to do at the end of the day. This wave of, you know what that wave of emptiness I'm talking about? Kind of wild, everyone, who knows it, who knows it, yeah? Okay, the rest of you are lying. Okay, so. Yeah, so, so I walk and I got notebooks and there's a Bible there, you know, and I'd like to thank at this point the Society of Gidonites for providing Bibles in our hotel rooms and it seems like an appropriate time to thank them. And it says in the beginning, I, I want to read the Bible because that's what I was trained in. I was trained in kind of the Hebrew Aramaic lineage and so there's like an index in the front of the Bible which says, you know, if you're having trouble with your relationship, read Psalm 97. If you're feeling impotent, read 12. You know, it's got this whole list and it says if you're lonely, could I have a little empathy here? Thank you. I wasn't that sincere, but that's okay. We'll work with that. Hope we'll get to know each other. So if you're lonely, read Psalm 23. So I went to read Psalm 23, which is, you know, right? the whole text, you know, yea, though I walk in the shadow of the valley of death, right? I fear no evil. And I finished reading, and I mustered all of the ecstasy of years of study, and I finished reading, and I was still lonely. Um, someone had written a phone number there. If you're still lonely, call Lola. So anyways, how we work with loneliness is going to be what we're going to talk about this morning, because actually all the ways we work with loneliness actually don't work, right? right? We, we all understand that there's something called loneliness that actually affects each one of us in a profound way, and you can be married in a great relationship and have profound loneliness, right? Right? And loneliness is something we don't admit. Right? We talk about all our issues in America on various television shows, and we admit you know, every kind of impropriety except for loneliness. We got so much to do on Saturday night. But actually, right, addressing loneliness, we have scripture on this, right? Lo tov heyota adam levado. But it's not good. After all the good of chapter one in the book of Genesis, remember that? And God saw that it was, remember? Good, God saw that it was? Good, second day God saw that it was? Third day, God saw that it was? Good. I thought this was a Baptist place. Try this again. Fourth day, and God saw that it was? Good. good right? Every day, it's good, it's good, it's good. And then you get to chapter 2 of Genesis, and the apex of Scripture, it says, it's not good. The, the entire play, the entire canonical text, there's only one place it says it's not good. The it's not good of chapter 2 of the book of Genesis stands against the good, all the good of chapter 1. It's not good. Lotov heyota adam levado. It's not good for the human being to be lonely. So to get to the good, we have to trance end. We have to end the trance of loneliness. So I want to talk to you about this morning. And what does that mean and, and how do we do it? And in order to do it, we've got to recover memory. 
And you see, the Greeks said that the loss of knowledge is the source of evil. Theotetus, Plato, right? But the mystics said the loss of memory is the source of evil. We have to recover memory, whether we're in addiction, right, to busyness and business as usual, or we're in addiction, right, to all the forms of substances that give us a feeling of pseudo-eros and pseudo-aliveness because we're not feeling the actual aliveness of our lives. We've got to be in a process of recovery. We're all recovering and we're recovering memory. But then they tell us in the beautiful and awesome, gorgeous, fundamentalist world that you've got to recover the memory of the past. The old truths that we once knew, if we knew those, if we recovered the forgotten truth, then we'd be liberated, we'd be saved, we'd be redeemed. And that's half the truth, but it's only half because lots of those old truths are homophobic and they're ethnocentric, right? And they don't recognize full rights of the infinite dignity of the human being. That's every color and every dignity. It doesn't have the dream that Martin Luther King dreamt because, because that consciousness wasn't in the world. And if you read what Buddha, and I love, I'm madly in love with Buddha, but you read what he spoke about women, you'll read and say, oh my God, goddess, what was he thinking? Right? It's complicated, right? right? Consciousness has evolved. We can't just go back to the old dream. We can't just recover the old story. We can't just have a memory of the past. We need to be the people who are birthing the memory of the future. Right? Hope is a memory of the future. Right? And as we birth that memory of the future here together, we are coding the no-sphere. Right? We are coding reality with a vision of what can be born because if God is anything, God is the possibility of possibility. And that possibility of possibility lives as us this morning and speaks as us. So from that place of infinite possibility, let's recover together, if you will, right, with your grace, right, with your goodness, with your truth, with your beauty, in service and devotion to you, let's recover together right, a memory of the future. So I want to tell you about a moment. We talked about loneliness and about a, a moment you know, in my life. You know, some X years ago, when just kind of that sense of loneliness and just the outrageous pain of reality was so heavy upon me. And I'd been teaching and, you know, talking, and I, you teach only what you need to learn, right? You know, I'm the only person who ever listens to anything I say, and I don't listen either. And eventually, maybe some of it will catch up, right? So I'm kind of teaching, right? Kind of, and I get to this point, you know, and I was, my, my actually internet wasn't working. I went to my friend's house who lives near my friend in Monterey, California, who's here. You know, because Sally, Sally Kempton, who's a yoga teacher, internet was working, and I'm giving a, a class to our retreat center, the head of that retreat center, great spiritual teacher, Shahad, is here with us in Holland, and there's like 50 people gathered, and I'm, I'm looking at the screen, and I'm, I just fall silent, and I've known that this group for, there's close students, and, and they said, wow, that silence must be like a deep, profound silence, and I knew that was what they were thinking, but it wasn't. I just didn't have anything to say. You know, right? I just like, I reached for every word I'd ever spoken, and it just rang false to me. I couldn't find it, right? And I, I started a sentence I couldn't get there. And I realized in that moment, I'm done. I can't teach anymore. I had a slight panic because there's nothing else that I know how to do, right? So it was kind of like my mother told me I should have, right? Right? So, right? And I'm just like, I've, I've, and, and I tried to say, I couldn't, I couldn't speak, you know? And so I shut my eyes and I was about to announce just completely sincerely, I sat for 10 minutes not talking that just, I'm sorry, I just, I just don't have anything else to say. And as I opened my mouth, I just started talking and just something came down, right? And an hour and a half later, when it was done, Sally Kempton, Swami Durgananda, some of you may know her work, right? Kind of handed me the notes of what had come down in that short time. And I wanna share with you, right? Those notes this morning with your permission, because it's, it's a vision of a new story. And it's a new story that I've come to from my place and Reverend Michael from his place. And we met in a place of holy synchrony, which is why I'm always so delighted on the phone or on text or in dialogue, right? To be right in this place that, that he and Ricky, right? Created and manifested and incarnated. So I want to just give you a couple of sentences, which are like the sentences that came and the questions that came down in that moment. So here we go. Okay, do I have a little drum roll in this house? Do we have like a little, are we awake? Are we alive? A little drum roll. Cheap seats in the back. What's going on back there? Okay, so be with me, okay? Right, and I'll be with you, and let's, let's, let's see if we can do this and find this. So here's what came down. We live in a world of outrageous pain. The only response to outrageous pain is outrageous love. Right, we live in a world of outrageous pain. Right, the only response to outrageous pain is outrageous love. We live in a world of outrageous beauty. The only response to outrageous beauty is outrageous love. 
That's the first thing I heard. Now I want to try and unpack those sutras that came down with you, but I want to tell you the other two things that I heard. And then I just heard this, this voice, right? And the poets call it inspiration. The entrepreneurs call it flow. And we call it revelation at the end of May, revelations, right? I heard a voice that said, we need a new story, right? Everybody needs to know that the universe, not in poetry, but in reality is a love story. We need a new story. We need a love story. We need an outrageous love story. I didn't quite know what it meant. And then I just heard questions. And the questions were something like as follows, right? Are you willing to play a larger game? So I want to put to you that question. Are you willing to play right, a larger game? Right? Are you willing to participate in the evolution of love? Right? So what is there to do? And, and who is there to do it? And, and when should we do it? Right? How does it happen? Right? That's the question. And the question is everything, my friend. Right? The answers? We were raised on theology for 2,000 years that was filled with answers, and we realized that those answers actually deadened our sensitivity to outrageous pain. Never let theology deaden your sensitivity to pain because that kind of theology is not kosher. Right? You understand, right? We've got to actually know not what the answer is, but what the question is. What's the quest that I'm on? When I know the quest that I'm on, that it's going to lead me in the direction that I need to go. Okay, so here we go. We live in a world of outrageous pain. And I want to say that on a Sunday morning because we don't like talking about that, right? right? Outrageous pain. They told us that Lincoln ended slavery. It's a lie. Lincoln began to end something in America that hasn't ended yet, right? But around the world, right, around the world, there are four times as many slaves as there ever were at the time of the Emancipation Proclamation. 17 million labor and sexual slaves in the world today, right? There are 17,000 children who die every single day. Right? of starvation or malnourishment in the next 24 hours. Right? There are 17 million right, children right, who die every year. There are children, soldiers, and then there are people all over the world who are brutalized. And it's, it's many of us in the room, and it's a part of each of us in the room, who are brutalized by loneliness, by, by the inability to find the full aliveness of our lives. And we walk around living those lives of quiet desperation, keeping that smile of radical positivity on our face, but it's not coming from within. And from that place where our eros of aliveness breaks down, all breakdowns and ethics take place. Because ethics and eros aren't in contradiction. All breakdowns and ethics come from a loss of aliveness. So we live in a world, my friends, of outrageous pain. But what's the problem of outrageous pain? So it used to be a theological problem. You get that? Theology. Let's work out how can God, who's omnipotent and all-powerful, allow for suffering. That's theology, right? That's not the issue anymore, right? We used to think about God as kind of the infinity of power. Beautiful. But now we've gone deeper and further. We've evolved consciousness, and we understand that the divine's not merely the infinity of power, but divinity is the infinity of intimacy. Can you feel the difference between those two? From infinity of power to infinity of intimacy? So, so when, when we have suffering in the world, it's not a failure of theologic. You get that? It's a failure of intimacy. And how can I live in a world which is an intimate universe when that intimacy is so violated in suffering? So when we live in a world of outrageous pain, we can't deny the pain and say it's an illusion. Right, that's one school, right? It's Maya. It's an illusion. Well, that kind of hurts, my friend. That illusion is really painful. Or we say kind of it's, it's punishment for sin. There's lots of, no, we got to say, we look at the outrageous pain. We say that's a failure of intimacy. So what do we need to do? We need to restore intimacy. How do you restore intimacy? The only response to outrageous pain is outrageous love. Outrageous love. So give me a hand for outrageous love. Give me a hand for outrageous love. Give it, give, give it up. Outrageous love. Right? Outrageous love. And then ask me a question. Ask me a question. What's the difference? Why don't we just talk about ordinary love, right? Let's talk about ordinary love. Why do we need outrageous love? What's the difference between ordinary love and outrageous love? Right? I mean, the World Trade Center is going up. And one of the epic, iconic tragic moments of this century and we kind of we like to have a villain right the bad guy osama bin laden we put it all on him we all get freed of responsibility right right we demonize him we ignore the larger right so it's going down the, the building's going down right you when do you say your sacred creed when do your true beliefs and and essence when does it emerge it emerges at the moment of your death and people phoned home and we have the sacred texts the sacred texts of this century are in part the cell phone transcripts of people phoning home in that moment, and, and no one read from Psalms. And no one recited the Shema prayer, and no one said the Lord's Prayer, right? And no one recited the Four Noble Truths of Buddha. Didn't happen. What did people say? People said, I love you. In three words, our sacred text. We've killed all the gods except for Aphrodite, the god of love. 
but we've lost the meaning of love. It doesn't take us home anymore. We talk about it, but we're not quite sure when words lose their meaning, my friends, culture collapses. Right, that sacred text, I love you, ordinary love, doesn't take us home. What's the difference between ordinary love and outrageous love? The difference between ordinary love and outrageous love is like the difference between a very high number and infinity. It's everything, right? Ordinary love, what we call love, is all too often, my friends, simply right, a strategy of the ego. Right? I love you, you'll keep me safe. I love you, we'll be comfortable. I love you, maybe I'll get some sex tonight. Right, right, right. I love you, right? Maybe you'll do better in the divorce settlement, right? I love you, maybe I'll have a place of belonging. I love you, I'll feel a little less alienated. I love you, someone's gonna listen to me besides my therapist, so I'll feel a little bit less lonely, even though I'll feel even more lonely afterwards because the words aren't ringing true. Ordinary love doesn't take us home. Right? How many people know what I'm talking about? You get that right? It doesn't take us home. It doesn't get us there, right? Because we make a bunch of mistakes. We think that love, we make three big mistakes about love. We think that love is a human experience only. Two, it's the experience of an emotion, energy in motion, what happens when it stops being in motion. Right? And then three, we think it's a particular emotion, which is the emotion of infatuation. Right? We're infatuated. So when we lose infatuation and the emotion shifts, we're kind of out of love and we fall down. Right? And we break down instead of break through. So what's outrageous love? It's outrageous love, my friends. Remember Tagore? that awesome Bengali poet. And whenever I mention a speaker or a thinker, and I say, do you remember him? Just nod. It just, it just works better in the room. Let me try that again. Do you all remember Tagore? Yeah. Do you remember back there, Tagore? Yeah. Right, Tagore is awesome, by the way. If you want to just kind of bathe in the radiance of the divine, read Tagore. Tagore says, he says, love, and he means ordinary love, is not merely a human sentiment. It's the heart of existence itself. Right? Outrageous love says Dante is the love that moves the sun and the stars. Right? Outrageous love is evolutionary love. Right? It's the love that doesn't begin with human beings. Right? If you make love a narrow human expression dissociated and desiccated from the larger aligned context of reality as it truly and really is, that love is too small to hold or heal or transform anything. Right? Love is that which initiates the entire process, when Stuart Kaufman, the great physicist at the Santa Fe Institute, says that in the universe there's a ceaseless inherent creativity, motivated, animated by the eros of love, which moves the entire process. When you have quarks, you ever seen a quark? Quark's a subatomic particle. You just walk out, walk here in the parking lot, you're going to see a few quarks walking around. You, see a, you got a quark walking around, right? And it looks around and says something on the left there, whoa, there's another quark. He's kind of hot, right? And they get together, and a single boundary forms around them, and something new, undeniably new and emergent is formed, that love births, which is called an atom. That's not human love. That's where human love comes from. Then atoms come together, they're allured. Like, why didn't the universe just stop at hydrogen? What's moving the entire process? What's the fifth force of the universe, as the physicists are now calling it, which drives everything, right, which is beyond randomness? Right, which is actually the initiating and animating eros energy of all that is that makes atoms come together and form complex molecules and molecules form cells and then cells awaken and they form kind of those early plants and then later plants right, and plant is fully intelligent and alive right, and then, then it forms kind of early mammals and later mammals and a neural net and a neural cortex and it goes, right, what's driving all that? What's making all that? That's called emergence theory in science. That's the movement of love. And what is love? Right, think about it. Love's not just this narrow little thing between you and me. Right? That thing between you and me is an expression of the driving eros of reality that unfolds everything and all that is. And without that force, what is love? Love is the eros. It's the movement towards greater and greater levels of mutuality, recognition, connection, union, right? embrace. And that force of love that moves us towards higher and higher levels of mutuality, recognition, union, and embrace is the arrest that drives all that is. Right? So if you actually open up the eye of the spirit and you check systems theory and chaos theory and complexity theory and the inner depths of quantum theory, as it comes together for the first time in history, you realize that the universe feels. And the universe feels love. You realize that love's not hard to find. Love's impossible to avoid. You hear that? It's impossible to avoid. You realize that in every single second of reality, every single part of you is drenched in divine love. And that actually, we spend our whole lives, my friends, waiting for that one person. 
and we put it all on them. And we look across them and, we, and everything, all the trauma and all the woundedness and all the addiction, all the pain, and, and in my family, maybe the Holocaust as well. It's all there, right? Will that person say, I love you? We put it all on them. Actually, in every moment, the universe is whispering in your ear. Right? That is the truth and the inner nature of reality itself. When you awaken to be real, that's what's real. And the universe is whispering and saying, I love you. I love you. I love you madly. I love you absolutely. I love you wildly. I love you ecstatically. And every place you fall, you fall into my hands. And there's no place else to fall. And you realize it's not just about I love you. To be awake and alive is to realize you love me. You love me, right? right? When I awaken and I realize the universe loves me and holds me, then what happens is I can begin to have a real love relationship with another person. Because I'm not putting it all on them. I'm actually held in the arms of reality that catches me wherever I am that's never not there. That's what Rumi was talking about when he said, fall into the arms of the beloved. That's not no self. That's not leaving your story behind. That's the infinite, personal, intimate face of all of reality that knows your name and calls you. That's not a Santa Claus God. God you don't believe in doesn't exist, right? That's the personal face of the infinity of intimacy, knowing and calling your name irreducibly, gorgeously saying, I love you. And if you want to be awake and alive, well, here, here's a sentence for you, okay? Take responsibility for your own arousal. You got that? You're just waiting for somebody else to do it all the time. But actually, you've got to do what the Kabbalists call itaruta de la tata, arousal from below in Aramaic, which means, right, I say to myself, you love me. I say it to the universe. When I say it to the universe, then I can say it to the person next to me. Not, you're not waiting all the time. Do they say, I love you? Do they say, I love you? No, you look at the person, you say, you love me. So how about this this week? Why don't we sign our letters to each other, you love me. You into that? Good? Give it up big, you give it up for you love me. You love me. You love me. Right, you get that? And I've got to know that. And if I don't know that, then I'm here parasiting with you. Will they love me? Will they like it? Will they like the talk? Will they not like the talk? Right, really? No, no, no. That's, that's a mess. You love me. Right? Done, right? You love me. Right? Right? And I love you madly, wildly, ecstatically, filled with awesome delight. Okay. So what do we got to do? We got to awaken as an outrageous lover. Let's go to the next step. My friends, this is obviously the next step. What does an outrageous lover do? Needs a job, right? Well, love, right? But not ordinary love, right? Right, outrageous love. Just give you one more distinction, just so we get this. Right? Ordinary love is you're always trying to get something. Like self-help courses, that's ordinary love. What can I get out of this? Right, transformation is, what am I going to put in? It's a completely different game, okay? Right, it's like there's, they call in Kabbalah, and mysticism, they call, there's, they call it the secret of the kiss. And the secret of the kiss is outrageous love, because in the kiss, giving and receiving blur into one. There's no distinction, right? Right, so ordinary love, what can I get? Right, outrageous love, what am I giving? Outrageous love asks one question every second. Am I open or am I closed? There's only one question. And right? if you forget everything we said this morning, one question in every single moment of reality, are you open or are you closed? Are you loving the moment open? Is the, the moment loving you open, or are you closed and the moment's closed, and that which needs to be birthed in this moment through you undeniably new is dead and stillborn because you weren't awake. Because you were looking for someone to love you, you didn't realize you love me. It's happening every moment, every second, all the time. Never not happening. Right? That is not poetry. Right? That is the poetry of reality, the physics of reality. So you awaken as an outrageous lover. What does an outrageous lover do? First, this is really important to say, the outrageous lover keeps every boundary that should be kept. Absolutely. Right? Amen. 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 Keeps every boundary that should be kept and then is wise and discerning and she breaks every boundary that should be broken and knows the wisdom to distinguish between those two and you know exactly what I mean. Okay. So let's go to the next step. But okay, Mark, but so what does an outrageous lover really do? The outrageous lover, my friends, commits outrageous acts of love. Can you hear that? The outrageous lover commits outrageous acts of love, not tepid, not carefully calculated to make sure that it comes back to me in the right way and I'm looking good, looking good, looking good, looking good. No, no. The outrageous lover commits outrageous acts of love. And you know what the nature of outrageous love is? It's outrageous. It's outrageous. Just feel that it's outrageous. Rage means anger, but it's called divine anger. It's the anger of the prophet. It's the anger that animated in civil disobedience Martin Luther King when he said, I have a dream, and he was outraged right, by the nature of reality. And he said that reality's got to change, and he was an outrageous lover. Right? To be an outrageous lover is to commit outrageous acts of love, but my friends, which ones? That's the big question. 
right? Which ones should you commit? There's so much that needs to be done, my friends. How do you know which ones to commit? So here it is. The outrageous lover commits the outrageous acts of love that are a function of his or her unique self. Now get that word unique self, okay? You with me? And this is where Brother Michael and I, right, met in the Dharma in about a, about a thousand million places from complete different places. And here the resonance and here, right, the one in its unique expression, right? So what is unique self? What is unique self? Unique self is the answer to that second question we ask. What's the question? Who are you? And my friends, right, the most important question I ever ask myself in the morning, who am I? Ramana Maharshi inquiry, who am I? Right, who are you? And the answer to that quest I'm on, on the answer to that question, everything rides. Right, is life but a walking shadow? Right, is it a poor player that struts and fruts its hour upon the stage, heard no more? Is it a tale told by an idiot, full of sounds, fury, signifying nothing, Shakespeare, Macbeth? Or is life a response to this question of who am I? So who am I? There's only one answer to that question, and it's not theological, and it's not dogmatic, and it's the emergent property of the integrated, integral wisdom from all the great traditions of spirit that we've gathered for the first time in history, integrated with all the different traditions of physics and the 11 schools of psychology and anthropology and ethnomethodology, right? And all that brought together brings you this sentence. Who are you? You are an irreducibly unique expression of the love intelligence. How's Reverend Michael say it? And the love beauty. You're an irreducibly unique expression of the love intelligence and love beauty of all that is that lives in you, as you, and through you, that never was, is, or will be ever again, right, in the history of all eternity. And that births your unique perspective. You have a unique perspective because you're located in a unique place in the space-time continuum, both of eternity and of temporality, right, of the world of here and now and the world of eternity. And that births your unique insight. And your unique insight allows you to awaken to be a lover, because what does it mean to be a lover? Ordinary love is an emotion. Outrageous love is a perception. Perception. But I clarify the lenses of perception. To be a lover is to see with God's eyes. You hear that? Yes. Right? To be a lover is to see the other person how you imagine correctly in your holy imagination because you've gotten over the crisis of imagination that sees you in your smallest and you see other as God sees you. To be a lover is to see with God's eyes. Right? So outrageous love is not an emotion. It's not an energy in motion that dies. It's a perception. It's to see with God's eyes. Right? So you have a unique insight. And your unique insight births, my friends, your unique gift. And your unique gift, and this is the promise of reality, your unique gift addresses a unique need in your unique circle of intimacy and influence that can be addressed by you and you alone. And you were born to give that gift. You were born to address that unique need. You were born, and just hear this, and hear this, and there's going to be a little party that doesn't believe it. But when you find that party that doesn't believe it, we're going to explode it together. There's a part of the world this is not poetry, this is not spirituality, this is the science of reality. It's the science of mind. Right? It's the mind of God in our hearts and in our bodies. Right? There's a dimension of reality which is unlove. And that dimension of reality which is unlove can be addressed by you and you alone. You are the only person who can stand on the abyss of that darkness and say, let there be light. Right? There's no other person that ever was, is, or will that can do it other than you. And the divine Lord of Rumi holding us can't do it. Because I want you to hear this, okay? When I say I love you, if divinity's saying I love you, what else is divinity saying? And I want you to hear this is the deepest, wildest thing that the great Kabbalists, mystics, Luria, and then in Sufism, Ibn Arabi ever said. Just hear this and you're not going to believe me, but, but it's the deepest insight of science and spirit, right? God needs your service. God needs you, right? God is impotent without your potency. God cannot potentiate without you incarnating your potential. And what it means to love someone is, I want you to hear this, is to need someone. I know it just came into my mind right now, and I'm going to date myself. You remember that old 20th century movie? Remember the 20th century, there were movies? And this is a city that knows something about movies. And it was called Rocky, $225,000. How many people saw it? Come on, come on, come on. How many people saw it twice? Let's, let's hold this right here, okay? So if you remember, there's a key moment in the Rocky. Rocky's kind of, there's another fighter. What's his name? Apollo Creed. Who's the better fighter? Apollo Creed, hands down. And Rocky's got to fight Apollo Creed. You know, and there's this kind of wild scene, and he just can't, he can't find it, right? He can't find it. And he has a girlfriend, love interest, Adrian, right? And there's a certain moment where he kind of just can't do it. He's given up, and he wakes up, and he says, Adrian! I need you. And then the music starts going. Ba -da -da, 
da 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 right? kind, of, kind of running up the courthouse steps because you wake up when you say I love you means I need you. And if divinity is crying out on every second, I love you, then divinity is saying, I need you because your deed says God is my need, right? And there's no division between them. And not to know that our deed is God's need is to be dead, right? It's to be impotent, right? It's not to be awake in any way. So feel into this with me, my friends, okay? Let's find it, right? What does an outrageous lover do? An outrageous lover commits outrageous acts of love. Which outrageous acts of love do you commit? Those that are a function of your unique self. Do you get that? So I walk into Agape, right? I'm saying like, you know, I'm running this think tank with Wilbur and, and Reverend Michael just joined our executive board. I'm doing my thing and I walk into Agape and I say, man, this scene's awesome. And then Ricky's singing and I feel even more off tune. This is awesome. And I say, man, I wish I could be doing this. It means I'm not in my unique self, right? All jealousy comes from not living your story. Jealousy is absurd. It's the nuts thing in the world. You're jealous when you say, I'm not in my unique self, right? It took 13.7 billion years for reality to have a Gothany experience, and it wasn't supposed to be, right, right, running this church. Who's supposed to run it? Reverend Michael. He was born to do it incarnation after incarnation. And when I walk in and I awaken as my unique self, I can say, man, in devotion, right, I can love the moment open. And I can be delighted, I can be ecstatic. And then we go and do 3.0 together and you've never seen four days right, of egolessness. We were just in total sync, just totally loving each other, right? Because we could love it open because we were living in, when you're living unique self, jealousy disappears, it's gone. It makes no sense. I mean, can you imagine I would say, hey man, I want your DNA. <laughs> hey, like your immune system's a lot hotter than mine, right? Maybe I could borrow it for a little while because those green drinks have done a good job. But truly, really, it's not just about the green drinks. Actually, what uniqueness is, right? I want you to do a little meditation with me for a second. You got a second with me? Okay, so go into your body for a second. Your body in this moment right now, right, is 75 trillion cells in unique complementary, unlike complementarity, unlike any other body that ever was, is, or will be. And those cells are a dazzling expression of beauty and elegance and delight that is virtually and beyond virtually unimaginable. And if you took the immune system of every person in this room and put it up on the overhead, each one would be a unique cellular and atomic signature, a unique symphony unlike any other. And it took the universe 13.7 billion years to gather together the instruments and the players to play the music, which is the uniqueness of reality in all of evolution, played as the instrument which is you. You want to be someone else, really? You get that? Oh my God, so jealousy is just gone. It, it disappears, it disappears, it's gone, it, it doesn't exist. So let's go one last step, okay? Let's find this. Okay, so jealousy's gone. And I realize that I am absolutely special. And I'm unlike anyone that ever was, is, or will be. So stay with me, okay? So what then happens? What do I realize? So I wanna do like a little play with you. Okay, one last play, and I'll take us home. Y'all heard of the Big Bang? Yeah. Big Bang, anyone heard of the Big Bang here? Yeah. Okay, Big Bang. How, thank you. Thank you, brother. She is in the room. So what happens? We think there's one Big Bang. We think evolution happens once. But actually, there is an idea already in the 13th century in the Mutazala, the great Mutazala thinkers of the great Arabic world where they say, even when they were thinking about creation, there's not creation once, there's constant creation. It's happening in every second. Now, stay with me. So then you gotta ask the great question in all theology, who cares, right? Why do I care? If it's the same thing that appears to me, who cares that some theologian, right, said that it's happening all the time? Because be an artist for a second. If you're an artist and you create something, when is the moment of radical aliveness and intimacy? When is it? It's at the moment when the artist creates it. So if that creation happened then, it was a long time ago. But if you actually realize with the inner eye of the spirit that creation is happening in every moment, there's a constant intimacy, right? Eros is happening in every second. Reality is Eros. And the line and the circle come together and birth new reality in every second. And what happens when you birth new reality? What do you cry out? Oh God, oh God, right? At that moment of climax when new reality is birth, you say, oh God, or you say yes. You say the name of the other person. Why? Because it's all the same name. When you cry out, oh God, yes, it's a yes to the name, which is your unique self, which is being birthed in every moment. So there's a process of constant creation, which we now call the evolutionary impulse. 
but the inherent ceaseless creativity of all of reality that moves reality forward, what Alfred North White had called the creative advance of novelty. White had said there's three properties of reality, the one, the many, and the creative advance of novelty, and every moment newness is born. So the first Big Bang is cosmological evolution, supernovas coming at you. Then what happens, second Big Bang is biological evolution. It all awakes as biology, as life. Third Big Bang, all of that life ascends to the hominids walking on the savanna, and then the human being about 100,000, 200,000, 35,000 different dates, 35,000 years ago, started playing music. For the first time there was music. For the first time we found people buried with harps. There was art, art and music meant there's the beginning of cultural evolution, the third Big Bang. And that happened for about 10,000 years. Now stay with me, my friends, because it's happening right now. Right, 300 years ago, the fourth Big Bang, for the first time in history, evolution moved from unconscious to conscious evolution. Evolution awakened to itself. Fifth Big Bang. The fifth Big Bang is the awakening for the first time in history of unique self. Not unique self as a property of ego. Not unique self as a property of grasping, but the irreducible uniqueness of all that is, the love intelligence of all that is living in you, as you and through you, giving its unique gift, you actually realize I am awakening as the evolutionary creativity of all of reality itself living in me, as me and through me, giving my unique gift. That's what it means to be a unique self. Wow, 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 no, but here it is. We wanna to go to six, that's where we wanna to get to. But there's a six big bang, with that I wanna finish. There's a six big bang, it doesn't stop at unique self, because stay with me for a second. We think that uniqueness is like being separate. We want to be kind of part of the one. Give me the one. Om, one. Really? Beautiful. Om is step one. Shalom. Om, step one. I move from separate self. I'm not merely a skin encapsulated ego. All right, I'm a what? I'm a, I'm a true self. What's a true self? A true self means, right, I'm no self. I'm part of the all. I'm, there's a seamless code of the universe, and I'm, I'm not separate from that. It's the one that Reverend Michael talks about all the time. But then I awaken more deeply, and I'm, merely, I'm not merely a true self. There actually is no true self any place in the manifest world. Actually, every true self has a unique insight, a unique perspective. Right? I'm actually a unique self. But that uniqueness doesn't separate me from people. And here's the sentence. Uniqueness is not the property of alienation. Uniqueness is the currency of connection. So to be a unique self, you want to hold an image in your mind, heart, body, toenails as we leave here. Unique self is a puzzle piece. It's a puzzle piece. And that's the unit. And you spend all your time, let me meditate to kind of round out the curves of my puzzle piece so I'll fit in. And then you're a perfect round circle. And you try and fit in, and the reality goes boom. Right? You don't fit in. It's not working. Right? Because actually, to awaken is to awaken to your irreducible, unique self, which joins you to the larger puzzle. You're a puzzle piece. I'm a puzzle piece. This is the puzzle piece dharma of loving your way to enlightenment. You awaken as an outrageous lover, committing outrageous acts of love, which are a function of your unique self, which is your puzzle piece essence. Now watch, which fits perfectly into reality. You feel that? Right? It completes the puzzle. You're the only person that ever was, is, or will be I that can complete the puzzle. And then you're located, you're held in the puzzle, and we've created the sixth big bang, which is evolutionary we space. We've moved from mastermind to metamind. We've moved to collective intelligence. We've moved to a new vision of unique self symphony, where we all come together as outrageous lovers, and we don't rely on the corporations because the corporations aren't going to do it. There's some conscious capitalism happening, John Mackey, which is a great step forward. And there's still crony capitalism, which is you know, all over the place. And the big government's not going to do it either. We need big government. We need social welfare programs. But the government, right, top down is not going to do it. Top down corporation, top down government is the old world. The new world is, remember that movie? What was it called? The Imagination Game or something like that? What was it called? Turing, about the Turing computers. Imitation game, thank you, I knew there was an I. The imitation game, Turing, Turing machine, the first computers, the code cracker, right, of the Nazi codes in World War II. So Turing wrote an essay called Morphogenesis. You got nothing to do tonight? Read it. It's the most awesome essay written in the last 50 years. Lots of mouth, don't worry. And what he basically says is that we live in a self-organizing universe. You ever seen an anthill? How many people have seen an anthill? Right, radically, wildly, intimately, self-organized. How does the anthill know what to do? How do the ants know what to do? The cemetery, right, is the perfect, right, proportion of distance away, right, from the place where the food's distributed. How do they know? So, so there are pheromones, chemicals are secreted that cause the ants to self-organize. Here's where we finish. How does the human world self-organize? It's self-organized in accordance with our unique self. Right? My unique self is the strange attractor of uniqueness that calls me to give my gifts. So let's finish in two minutes, right, one minute. We're probably one minute over, I don't even know the time. All right, so here we go. So we're gonna do an outrageous act of love. You with me? We're gonna finish with an outrageous act of love? Okay, so here it is. Very, very short story, okay? Right? It is the day of Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. 
And the master says to the congregation, I have a secret which will allow you to deceive the angel of death. And this is the day where everything, all the books of life and death are open and everyone's kind of, wow, am I gonna make it? Let Leonard Cohen sings right this in his songs, who shall live and who shall die? Right, the great mystical day and the high priest enters the holy of holies of the temple in Jerusalem. He says, I've got a way you can avoid the angel of death. Gavain, do you wanna know it? Herzog Tzu says, listen, do you wanna know it? Do you wanna know it? Do you wanna know it? You gotta wanna know it. You gotta wanna know it, you wanna know it, right? So he says like this, he says, turn to the person, I'm gonna invite you to do this, let me just say it, and then if you're up for it, let's be outrageous lovers. This is outrageous what we're about to do. If you turn to the person next to you and you say, I'm not willing to be written in the book of life without you. Ah, and the angel of death is totally confused and l'chaim to life. So if you're willing, look at the person next to you. Look at the person next to you. And if you're up for it, repeat after me, the person with the longer hair goes first, right? <laughs> I'm not willing. To be, to be written in the book of life, book of life. Without, you. without you. Person with the shorter hair, I'm not willing, I'm not willing. To, be written to be written in the book of life, book of life. Without, you. without you. Every human being has a story. That story deserves to be lived and prayed. Amen. 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 Up. Brother Mark. Outrageous loving is happening right here at Agape. Love streamers, outrageous loving is happening right here at Agape.